Job done. Freeman sat back and waited. The next thing I knew was one morning while I was having a bath here, the telephone rang. And I got up and went to the telephone unclad, quite naked, and there was Ewan McDowell on the telephone. McDowell was a journalist with the New York Times. I'd never heard of him before, and I talked to him for about 40 minutes. And on the 31st of January, it was on the front page of the New York Times. Scenting blood, the rest of the world's media latched onto the story. The media loved Freeman's book in a way that uh, shocked me. For almost two years, the media uh, took this story and ran with it and created story after story. I think the attack fed into the love that the public has of debunking heroic figures. There's almost an anti-heroic tendency, and Meade was something of a hero. For so many years, The Outsider, Derek Freeman was now a bona fide media celebrity. I don't think he assumed that this would make him world famous and they'd write plays about him and things. I think he didn't mind that once it happened <laughs> any more than Margaret did. But I don't think he, he predicted that. Certainly, Freeman couldn't have predicted that he and his book would make it onto primetime TV. Derek Freeman, uh, Professor Emeritus Anthropology, Australian National University. You're a uh, nature guy. I was asked to appear on the Donahue show with Kathy Bateson and Derek Freeman, which at the time I think had the highest television audience of any show, about 36 million viewers. And uh, throughout the show, whenever the lights would go down and there would be a commercial break, he would lean over and whisper intimidating things in my ear like, I'm going to get you, or I'm going to find mistakes in your work, you're next on my agenda. I was made a Samoan chief. This boy is untitled. No, I have a PhD, my friend. Yeah. One moment you would see the, the, the charming and polite face. At another moment you would hear real viciousness in what he was saying. And you came to feel that there was a sort of reptilian quality to him that you didn't know when he would strike. With their profession under attack as never before, the anthropological community began to close ranks. This was an attack that went too much to the heart of what they believed. Not, not just what they knew or what they demonstrated, but what they believed. And so the, the response was, was quite violent. I actually don't think that most people were defending Margaret Mead personally, herself. Anthropologists love a good fight, and they have no problem with restudies and with people attacking one another, but they have a sense of a fair fight. And I think there was a sense that this was not a fair fight. The opening salvo came from the august offices of the American Anthropological Association. The American Anthropological Association, in one of its greater moments of glory, actually passed a resolution saying that his book was in error. It was scientific error. <laughs> as though this can be decided, I, and this used to drive Derek nuts. Condemned by his peers, Freeman nevertheless drew strength from his newfound isolation. Derek said, in effect, shame on you for condemning a piece of uh, valid objective research. It betrays your own ideological commitment and the insufficiency and deficiency of your supervision of research practices. There was a very angry response. He could not believe that truth could be determined by consensus, by a show of hands. He couldn't believe that uh, the scientific method was being cast out in that manner. He was incredulous. By now, Freeman was being attacked from all sides, as magazine articles, academic papers, even books were churned out in defense of Margaret Mead. Her defenders argued that Meade had visited Samoa in the 20s, while much of Freeman's evidence had been gathered as late as the 1960s, and that in the intervening 40 years, much was bound to have changed. It was as if he was blind 
to things that any thoughtful scholar would take into account. Mead and Freeman really saw two different Samoas. On the one hand, the Samoa that Margaret Mead experienced had far less influence of the church than the one that Derek Freeman really was, was used to. Furthermore, the two anthropologists had got their information from very different sources. Freeman, very proud of the fact that he was a chief, would naturally gravitate towards the information from the chiefs. And Mead, who was assigned to really interview adolescents, not chiefs, and her information came largely from young girls. It's not surprising that the information would appear quite different from both of these sources. Freeman was also accused of placing far too much emphasis on Samoa's system of ceremonial virgins, or taupos. Freeman concluded that Samoans worship virginity and that indeed uh, place a higher value on virginity than probably any other society known to anthropology. What Freeman doesn't talk about are the marriages of everybody else. The Taupo system applied to the very upper tiers of Samoan society. It did not apply to most of the rest of Samoan society, which had a different system of marriage. But most damaging of all for Freeman, Mead's sympathizers publicly questioned his academic rigor. Some of the critics took a close look at how Freeman carefully edited and manipulated information. And this is not something that people expect of scholars. And if you analyze the intellectual structure of his attack in detail, it was inconsistent, it was full of quotes out of context, it was intellectually dishonest, and it was just poison. By the mid-80s, it appeared as though Derek Freeman's attempt to refute coming of age had failed. That both Meade's reputation and the supremacy of nurture over nature had weathered the storm. But Freeman wasn't prepared to throw in the towel just yet. He was just like a dog that's got his teeth into something, a bulldog doesn't let go. And Derek was not about to let go of this. This was his final claim to fame in the world, and I think that he was anxious to keep this alive as long as he could. In 1987, Derek Freeman went back to Samoa, accompanied by a film crew making a documentary about the Mead controversy. He became intensely curious about what had happened with Margaret Mead's research in Samoa in those early days. He wanted to find out. Um, he really genuinely wanted to get to the bottom of that mystery. Less than 24 hours after his return, Freeman stumbled upon a remarkable piece of new evidence that appeared to totally undermine the key message to emerge from coming of age. The central thing about the book that, that everybody has globbed onto since, and of course this was the central thing that American society had, taken from Margaret Mead was the ease of sexual existence of the Samoan girls with their casual lovers. They, I mean, they invented recreational sex, as, as we came to call it. Freeman's new evidence seemed to give him an extraordinary insight into just how Mead had reached this conclusion about the Samoan attitude towards sex. Well, the day after we arrived in Samoa, we heard that there could be someone on an island close by who had been living on the mainland for many, many years and had come back to live in Samoa again and that she was actually one of the girls that Margaret Mead interviewed. The woman's name was Fa'a Pua. More than 60 years ago, she and Margaret Mead had been close friends. Derek was very excited about that news because for years and years he'd been trying to find someone and he hadn't. What's more, Fa'a Pua was prepared to be interviewed by the two Australians. He was over the moon. He said, oh, my God, this is, you don't know how important this is. This is wonderful news that uh, someone's alive who can tell the story. He, he knew the significance more than I did. When we 
sat down to interview um, the lady, uh, we had absolutely no idea what she was going to say or how deeply connected she was to Margaret.